Hey guys, um, welcome to the, the engineering talk. Uh, we are going to begin momentarily. Um, one thing I will say, and I think uh, our host has posted it in the channel, but uh, if you have questions while I'm going through this talk, go ahead and scan the QR code and you can send questions over and I'll, I'll take a look at them at the end of the discussion. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, welcome. This is, uh, this is a talk about Polaris, which is a uh, Django application and framework that allows you to build uh, anchor servers uh, according to the standards that we define uh, that are called Stellar Ecosystem Proposals, or SEPs. Uh, so Django Polaris is a tool that we use so that, um, or a tool that we build so that anchors can uh, get their anchor service up quickly and uh, with less work required. So I'm gonna go into the details of uh, how to build this anchor. But before I do, I'm gonna go over a brief presentation that just describes what it is, how it works, and uh, what you can expect in this presentation. So uh, let's go ahead and begin. So like I just said, uh, Polaris is a Django anchor app, or I like to say it's an extendable Django app, which means that uh, if you know anything about Django, uh, and hopefully you do in this presentation because I'm gonna be going into Django code, um, but Django is a system, it's a framework that allows you to plug and play different applications within the project. Uh, and so Polaris is an app, it's a reusable app that you can plug and play within Django applications. And it provides an interface, uh, an, an API that developers can use to uh, insert and customize the way that the anchor server responds and handles information. Uh, the, the reasoning behind this is that uh, SEP24, which was the original standard that we implemented this for, uh, has a lot of things that are standard about it. Every anchor is going to be uh, doing similar things. They're all gonna have deposit endpoints. They're all gonna have info endpoints. They're all gonna have uh, what the SEP describes. And when I say the SEP, sorry, I'm just gonna break out of my, Actually, I'll, I'll stay in the slides until, until after birds, but 724 is a standard and it, it just defines an API for clients to be able to hit in order to, uh, in order to interface with the anchor. And every anchor that implements 724 has the same endpoints. The difference though, is that every anchor has, uh, you know, pieces of functionality that are custom to them. So Polaris, what it does is implement the stuff that's standard that everybody's gonna do. And then it allows people to customize uh, their own instances with their, you know, their unique situation. Uh, so overall, it's less time for the anchor to build. Uh, people can typically get this up within an hour because we're going to do it right now. Um, and we maintain it. The SDF maintains it. So we're going to continue to upgrade this, make sure it's up to date with the recent standards, uh, make sure it's up to date with the SDK upgrades, um, and it's open source. Everything that I am going to use right now is viewable on GitHub, and we have links uh, for the documentation and code uh, in following slides. So uh, in order to understand Polaris, we need to talk about integrations. Uh, Polaris offers integrations or integration functions or classes uh, that allow anchors to register uh, custom functionality with Polaris. So Polaris is gonna facilitate you know, the API endpoints and uh, build out what a SEP24 server would be. But there's things that uh, Polaris can't automate, right? So Polaris can't automate your banking or payment rails, right? Uh, if you're an anchor in Brazil, uh, you know, me as the developer of Polaris, I don't know what bank you're connecting with. I don't know what API you're using. I don't know anything about that. So what you need to do is inject your own banking and uh, payment rails code into the Polaris framework. Uh, in the same way, we don't know what uh, information you need from users. So you may need email and that's it. Or you may need a photo of the ID. You may need, um, you know, a variety of different information, social security number if you're in the US. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that you could, you could need, you could require in order to deposit or withdraw assets. Um, and so KYC kind of goes hand in hand with user tracking. You want to know who's using your service, who they are, how to reach them, uh, stuff like that. Uh, there's UI customization. So Polaris comes out of the box with uh, a decent UI, uh, but if you want to customize that UI, you're free to do so. Um, and finally, there's just Transaction processing, when, when, when the transaction gets to a certain state in the flow, you may want to update some of your own uh, data models to adjust for the, for the change. Uh, and so Polaris can't automate any of those things. So it provides uh, Rails integration classes. So you would, in your code, you would write 
you know, within the Rails integration class, uh, a, a, you know, a function that connects to your bank and actually makes payments to users. Um, and you're going to register that integration that you write with Polaris. And I'll show you how to do that. So uh, that transitions, you know, well, uh, how do you use Polaris? Well, we're going to do two things in this talk. Uh, we're going to install and configure Polaris, and we're going to implement the integration points, or the, at least enough integration points to get the Anchor server up and running. Um, and so there's going to be a few steps involved in that. Uh, we're going to create a Django project, and hopefully people who are viewing this uh, are familiar with Django and are familiar with the SEPs. I'm going to brush over some details about the SEPs so you have some context, but overall this talk is going to assume that you know what I'm talking about when it comes to Django and Stellar ecosystem proposals. Um, you're going to install Django. You're going to install the uh, Django Polaris package. Uh, we're going to uh, add Polaris, uh, the Django app itself, to the project. And then we're going to add a bunch of Polaris settings and configuration options. And finally, we're going to register and add our data, our asset that we're going to anchor uh, within our database. And, and the, asset that we're gonna, we're, uh, the asset that we're going to anchor in this database is a, uh, or on this anchor, is our uh, Stellar Reference Token, SRT. It's a, just a fake token on testnet uh, that doesn't mean anything, but it's, it's used as demonstration. So you can show, or show I can show, how people uh, you know, build Anchor services around an asset. Um, once we have all the configuration and installation set up, we're going to start implementing integrations. So uh, the first thing that we're gonna do is build a, uh, an appropriate TOML file. Uh, and if you're familiar with step one, uh, this is implementing that. Um, it's basically a file that describes the organization that own, owns the anchor and, uh, and it gives a bunch of details about contact information and stuff about the asset that uh, clients who are viewing the file are going to need to know. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of some banking rails. So we're not going to connect to any particular bank. Um, and so it, we're, we're actually going to kind of just mock this up. Uh, but the idea is that you would fill this function in with actual banking payment rails code, I'm just going to do what's required from a functional standpoint to make sure Polaris is working. Uh, once we have the TOML and banking Rails integration set up, we're going to register those integrations. And then finally, we're going to build the application with Docker and get it running. Um, so hopefully that gives you a good overview of what's going to happen here. Uh, and again, remember everything that uh, I work on here is open source uh, and there are, there's documentation available. So if you want to take, check out the documentation, uh, it's available at jingopolaris.readthedocs.io. And uh, the code is available at um, github.com slash stellar slash Django Polaris. Uh, and, and these these pictures are are the are some pictures from our test server or our reference anchor server that shows you how to do it. Um, it's basically an example. And uh, and these are just some some forms that Polaris provides out of the box. So this is what the UI looks like if you didn't do any customizations. Um, okay, and we're gonna do questions after the, the demo. Um, but for now, I'm going to transition into coding and, uh, and I'll probably be hopping back and forth from the internet as well to reference the proposals and, and just demonstrate certain things. Um, okay, cool. We are right on schedule. Um, so this is PyCharm. Uh, I'm going to be, you know, Django Polaris is a Python application. Uh, and what we're going to do, uh, when we start off most, most Python applications is create a virtual environment. Um, so. Actually, sorry, before I, uh, before I dive into the code here, I do want to show you uh, one thing, and that's a, um, a demonstration of what you can expect an anchor to look like um, from a user's perspective. And, uh, and this is a little demo that we do. So what I'm doing here is this is a little demo wallet that mocks like what a user would see. And we're going to walk through a SEP24 flow before we get started. That, so you can just see what it's going to look like. Um, but we're just going to use our reference server that the Stellar uh, Development Foundation runs and provides. Um, and we're just going to walk through a deposit flow on testnet. So this is what we're going to ultimately build. We want to get to this point uh, by the end of this talk. So I'm going to make a deposit. It's going to go through the SEP24 flow. And it's going to open up the actual interactive page that the user is going to see. So uh, if I was a user, this is the first form that would be presented to me. Uh, I'm trying to make a deposit. Uh, onto into my account on Stellar, and uh, and here is the amount field that's asking me, to, you know, to, to specify how much I I plan to deposit. Uh, and so I'm going to tell them that I'm going to deposit $100. And on testnet, uh, anchors need to assume that 
deposits are actually sent, right? On testnet, everything's fake, right? So I'm not actually going to send money to the anchor. Uh, it's just going to assume or, or understand that it's on testnet and it doesn't need to wait for me to actually pay them. And it's going to pay um, or send, you know, stellar funds to my account. Uh, and just to give you some like, more context, this con, uh, config option, this is obviously the, the reference server that we're hitting, the URL of it, but this is the secret key of my account. Um, and don't, don't worry, there's nothing you know, fancy on it. You can check it out on testnet. Uh, but I'm just going to deposit a $100 or 100 SRT uh, into my account on testnet. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, and so now uh, Django Polaris, after I submitted the amount, is going to go ahead and work on depositing that, those funds into my account. So it's executing on the, uh, the transaction, as you can see, and uh, now it's complete. So if I were to go to uh, my account right now, I can show you that I have at least 100 SRT in my account. Uh, and I'm not going to show you uh, what that is. It's not worth it. But, um, but this is a kind of a page that displays all the information on the transaction. So I sent them $100, supposedly. Uh, I was charged $1.01. And the amount that I actually received in, in my seller account, the amount of SRT is 98.99. Uh, and it you know, tells you when it was completed in the status and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so this flow of being presented some forms, filling out forms, being presented updates as the transaction is submitted, and then finally getting a you know, notification that's complete, that's going to be the user experience. Uh, behind the scenes, Polaris is going to be doing a lot more, and I'm going to walk through what that is. OK. Um, so. That's the end of the demo. We're going to go into the code. And, uh, and here we go. Bear with me in case uh, something happens, because something always happens in demos. Uh, but we'll, let's see how far we get. I'm, I think we're going to be able to do it. So uh, like I was saying, uh, with any Python project, uh, you're going to want to create a virtual environment. Um, so I'm going to create a virtual environment right now using Python 3. Um, and I have a little shortcut that activates the virtual environment. Um, but let's just do it um, you know, the normal way. So I'm just gonna execute the um, activate function for the virtual environment. Um, so this is dot VNV and activate. Uh, okay, so now I'm in a virtual environment. This little enclosed box where I can install my own packages and make sure you know everything that I'm doing here is contained in here and it's not affecting anything else outside of my project. Uh, and before we do this, actually, um, I'm going to go to the documentation. Uh, so this is the Polaris documentation. Uh, it's available at jingo.polaris.readthedocs.io. Um, and it's going to walk you through uh, how to install Polaris. Now, uh, I'm going to update these documentation uh, in the future. Uh, I'll probably have some kind of like tutorial page where it gives you a, you know, front to back how you set it, basically what we're doing in this talk. Um, but for now, I'm going to hop around these settings and these documentation uh, pages because you know they add different information and it's not organized in one way where I can just kind of scroll through. Um, so the first step we're going to do, we're just going to copy and literally walk through these steps. Uh, we're going to install Polaris. Uh, and while that installs, uh, I'm just going to go over kind of what it holds. You know, obviously it holds Django and it holds it really holds everything that you're going to need to run this application. So you don't need to actually install Django separately or anything like that. Everything comes with Polaris um, and it's ready to go. Uh, so that's done now. And uh, now that we have the uh, Django Polaris package, we have Django installed now because Polaris comes with everything. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a Django project. Now, um, this is, yeah, so I have this function called, or this command line tool called Django admin, which comes out of the box with Django. Right, so I'm going to create uh, a Django project, or start project, and I'm going to call it app. It's going to be super generic. Okay, now if I look, I actually have an app folder, uh, and you can see it in my uh, in my source tree. Uh, if you look in app, uh, I have a manage.py script, and this manage.py script is basically the uh, entry point to all of Django's functionality. So whenever I run Python within the Django context, I'm going to run Python manage.py some command. Uh, and then within the app, uh, I have all the files that are necessary for a Django application. Uh, and we're not going to go over again, this isn't a Django tutorial. We're going to assume that you know generally what this is. Uh, but uh, it's helpful to understand where we're at. So um, let's get started. So now that we have uh, our Django project, uh, we have an app set up. Uh, we are going to add 
um, Polaris to our app or to our project, right? Uh, so the first thing that we need to do is add these three apps here uh, to the installed apps list in settings.py. So let's open up settings.py. This is a generated file that uh, Django creates for you. It comes with a secret key that you're gonna, definitely gonna wanna keep secret. So you would never wanna check this file into Git, you know, it just being auto-generated. Uh, you wanna use environment variables and hide you know, those, those secrets from, from users and developers. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is a generated file for Django and here's our installed apps list. And we're just gonna copy and paste the three uh, apps that Polaris requires into the list. Now, uh, let me go over what these are. So uh, this package called cores headers, this is a, a different package outside of Polaris that is installed with Polaris. It, it, uh, it ensures that your server uh, allows requests to set 24 endpoints from any uh, service or client. Um, so it just sets the cores policy for the server. Um, this REST framework is a, uh, it's just a, another app that uh, Polaris uses to uh, build out its API. Uh, and then finally you install the Polaris app. Uh, and because we have our own app, right? Because Django, so this is a project, right? This app is a project, but within the app, <laughs> I know that the app and project word is gonna get confused here, but within the app directory, we have a Django application called app. Uh, so I can change the name of this top level app thing. That's the project directory. And then within the project directory, we have the app directory and the app directory is essentially the app that we are running, right? Alongside the other apps that we have installed in our installed apps list. Uh, so I'm gonna also add app uh, to the installed apps list too. Um, the next thing that we're gonna do uh, is we're gonna add the cores middleware. So that cores package that I told you about, it requires a middleware component. Uh, Jingo comes default with a bunch of middleware uh, and our documentation actually requests that uh, the cores middleware is above the common middleware. So um, this is necessary for Django reasons. Um, the middleware is the order matters. Uh, I'm not gonna go too far into deep into it, but uh, you wanna make sure that we have um, all the components that we add in the correct ordering, at least in this section. Um, cool, and then finally, uh, we're gonna add a project root setting to our, uh, to our project. And this is going to tell Polaris essentially where the top level is, and it's going to uh, look for an environment uh, an environment file at the top level of this uh, project. So I'm going to you know initialize project root, and I'm actually just going to make it the uh, directory containing baster. So baster it uh, was generated automatically by Django, but it's actually this folder right here. It's the right or actually is it? So there's the file. It takes the absolute path of that. It's the directory containing that file. Oh, it's actually this file. So this is the application folder that Baster is referencing. And so I'm gonna take the directory that contains that directory. So uh, project root is gonna be my actual project root, uh, Polaris Anchor 3. Um, and this is uh, important because we're gonna add a uh, .m file. And this is gonna contain all of our uh, environment variables that customize our Polaris deployment. Um, so let's go into there <clears throat> and, uh, Polaris has a few environment variables right there that I need to just stick in the, the file. So, uh, you know, for the network that we're using, we're going to be using, uh, the test net. So this is the, the network passphrase for that, uh, for that network. And then the, this is the horizon instance or URL of the instance that we'll be using. And then this is, uh, our host URL. So we're going to be doing this all on localhost. So I'm just going to do localhost about 8,000, um, there we go. And, uh, and that's it for environment variables for now. Uh, and then we are going to add Polaris's URLs, all the endpoints that Polaris exposes uh, to our Django application so that it's actually exposed. Um, so it's gonna give me, it's gonna complain to me right now because it doesn't have some of these functions. So we're gonna import include, and then we're also going to import uh, polaris.urls. Cool. Um, and so I don't know if you're familiar, you, some of you maybe, but, um, but so we have this admin endpoint that's already there. It comes default with every Django deployment. And then uh, on top of that, at the root of the domain. So uh, in order to get to the admin page, you would go to your domain slash admin uh, in order to hit any of the Polaris endpoints. It's just straight on the domain. So um, so Polaris uh, comes with a bunch of URLs 
Um, I'm, oh, you know what? It's because PyCharm doesn't know where my virtual environment is. I was going to go into the source code and show you what's offered. Uh, but Polaris offers a bunch of endpoints. In fact, they're described right here. All these endpoints uh, Polaris provides. Uh, and uh, those URLs are going to be exposed at the root of the domain. Um, OK, so now that we have our uh, URLs installed, we're going to, where's the documentation link? Ah. OK, uh, now that we have our URLs uh, added to the project, we're actually going to stop here because this is a uh, this is setup that's going to be required for every uh, installation of Polaris. But now we're going to go through the steps that we're actually going to deploy. So so Polaris can deploy any number of steps in any combination. So you could you could literally do Polaris and just deploy step one, uh, which is a Tomo file. You could deploy Polaris and just do step ten. You could do uh, Polaris with everything. You could do it with one of them missing and so forth. Right. So uh, we're going to set up Polaris. Uh, for step 1, 10, and 24. And that encompasses everything that's required in order to successfully run a, a deposit withdrawal. So let's go to uh, step 1. Uh, the configuration required is just to add it to our active steps list. So this active steps list in settings uh, is a key uh, setting in Polaris. It uh, basically signals to Polaris what we're running, what, what, kind, what uh, standards do we want to actually run on our server. Because we're not going to run them all by default, right? Uh, you may just want one of them. So we're going to add step one to our active steps list. And we're actually going to add step 10 and step 24 as well. And this is going to tell Polaris what URLs to expose uh, so that you don't have like a step 31 URL exposed when you're not using it. Um, OK, uh, that's actually all that's required in terms of configuration. We'll go into the integrations later. Uh, step 10 has the same thing, except it requires a few new environment variables. Uh, so Let's add, so this actually, this documentation is incorrect. It says, add the following uh, variables to your settings file. You don't need to add these two to your settings file. I'm going to update this. Uh, this should actually go in your environment uh, config. And it, if you didn't know that, um, Django would complain to you about it, so you'd figure it out. Um, but yeah, so for step 10, we have this thing called a signing seed, which is essentially the server's password for, uh, for signing transactions that then the client would sign as well, and then the server would authenticate. Uh, so I'm not going to go too deep into what step 10 is, but it's just a way for um, servers to confirm that uh, a user that's using their service holds the account that they're actually trying to deposit to. Uh, and this should just be like a random key pair um, that you keep secret. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to import Stellar's SDK, uh, import key pair, key pair class, and I'm just going to do a random key pair. And uh, and then uh, just have the signing seed uh, listed in the environment. So again, this is something that you'd want to keep secret. This would not be checked into Git, and uh, and uh, this obviously won't be deployed. Um, but the code that I'm uh, writing right now will actually be available in. Uh, uh, on my GitHub, and I'll I'll send a you know I'll I'll show a link, uh, and and maybe we'll actually have it in the description uh, of the event. That'd be awesome too. Um, so you can always see reference what I'm doing here, or just watch the video back. Um, okay, and then the server JWT key. So uh, once the client is authenticated, the server is going to return a token that's essentially the client's password uh, for interacting and hitting the server's endpoints. Uh, and you just want to have a secret string. Uh, that you use to encode the JWT. So we're going to have the super secret JWT string. Uh, you'd obviously want to make this something different. Cool. So now we have everything we need for step 10. Let's go to step 24. Again, we need to have the step 24 string in our active steps. Uh, we already did that. Uh, but one thing that we need to do on top of that is configure our static assets. So uh, as you saw in that little demo, Polaris comes out of the gate with, um, with a UI that's built in and, and ready to go for you to use and customize if you want to. Uh, and, and it does that by, um, by having the static files app installed and uh, having static resources to use for the UI. Um, and so we're going to configure the static resources in order to, to work and deploy. Um, so in order to do that, uh, we're going to add white noise uh, to our uh, installed apps list. And white noise is a, um, 
is a static file serving application. It just makes uh, serving static files more efficient. Uh, so we're going to do that. We're going to go to uh, settings. We're going to go to installed apps. Oh, actually, it's a middleware. <laughs> this is another thing I need to fix. The documentation will be up updated uh, by the time I, I release 1.0. Django is, or Polaris is at uh, 0.12 right now. It's a pre-1.0 -re pre release. Um, but uh, anyway, this is supposed to go in the middleware. Uh, so let's go to our middleware section. It should be above, uh, it, should, it says it should be the, near the top of the list for best performance, but still under cores middleware. Uh, so we're gonna go under cores middleware. Cool, um, and we obviously want to make sure that uh, the static files app is actually in our installed apps list. Uh, and then finally, we have some more settings uh, for our settings file. And these all pertain to uh, the static files app. So we're gonna have a root directory to contain all of our static files. So each app that we installed, REST framework, Polaris, even the app that we're using right now, uh, has static files that it's gonna use when it's running. And so what, Polar, uh, what Django does is it collects all those apps into one spot uh, instead of having to fetch them from a particular app. Uh, so we're gonna call a directory called collect static, which is the name of the command that we're gonna use to collect those files. Um, and we're gonna have it be uh, within the base directory. So it's gonna be just outside our uh, inner app directory. Uh, this is the URL that our static assets are gonna be available at um, for Django. Uh, so I'm just gonna say it's Polaris static. And then we're using this uh, storage um, component for uh, the white noise static file serving section. So this is just one of the many ways that white noise can store files uh, and then uh, return them when they're requested by the client. Um, okay, and then in order to collect those uh, static files, we're gonna run uh, our first command from manage.py and we're gonna collect our static assets. Um, where, did my, uh, where did my terminal go? Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so we're going to run that command, but that didn't work because we're not uh, in the same directory as the app or the manage.py script. That's within our app directory. Okay, so it gave me an error and it said, nope, you're not ready yet. Uh, you don't have a signing seed environment, uh, environment variable, uh, but we do. So what's the problem here? Uh, oh, I know. We don't have our settings file, our Django project, isn't aware of our environment. Uh, and that's, uh, that needs to be fixed. So we're gonna import uh, Django Environ or Environ. Uh, this is a package that comes installed with Polaris. Uh, and we are going to check, we're gonna have an, uh, an environment object. We're gonna check if uh, the path to our environment exists. Um, so you remember how we are gonna, I told you we're gonna use project root um, to know if the environment is there or that's where we're going to look. So we're going to look at the directory, the project root directory, and we're going to look for a .m file in that directory. And then if, if it's there, we're going to read that file. Okay. So now let's try this again, and uh, hopefully it knows that we have a signing seed now. env is not defined. You're right. It's because it starts off with the environ package. Okay, so now it's complaining about the server JWT key. Um, that's in the same file as the other environment. So, or as the other variable. So I wonder why this is complaining about that, but not the signing seed server JWT key. Is it because we have this spacing between the environment and the, or the equal sign? Yeah, it was, I guess. Okay, we have one more step uh, that I glossed over, I guess. Um, there's one more middleware. Oh, right, okay. So before, we, so we set up, so this page for this documentation is, is for set six and set 24 uh, because they share a majority of the uh, integrations that Polaris offers. Uh, but there is some setup that's necessary for set 24 particularly. Uh, and and uh, specifically we have this 
uh, same site middleware class that comes custom with every Polaris deployment. Uh, and this is more of a legacy component. Uh, we now suggest that uh, that anchors, or sorry, that wallets show anchors interactive flows uh, in pop-ups. But originally, they were uh, we were we instructed people to open them via iframes. And in order to show, uh, in order to have sessions within an iframe, you need to have certain HTTP headers. Um, and so this middleware class was born to inject those headers into every response. Um, so this is required just in case clients open up your interactive flow in an iframe as opposed to a pop-up. Uh, so let's add this middleware class uh, and then we can go ahead. Okay, uh, now it's added and it's supposed to be above session.middleware or sorry, below. Oh no, session.middleware should be below same side middleware. Okay. Um, and then finally, we need this form renderer class. And this is going to allow uh, for that really, uh, for that UI that we provide. And it's going to allow you to override any of those assets. So this is, so this is needed if you want to, uh, you know, override any static assets or use the default UI, which you're going to want to do if you're running step 24. Um, okay. Let's, okay. We're done with configuration now. Hopefully this will allow me to compile my static assets. There it goes. Okay. So now we have a new directory called static or uh, collect static, and it holds all the static assets that we're going to use uh, within uh, our application. So that's great. Um, and I think now that we have everything set up from a configuration standpoint, uh, we are free to go back to our database model section uh, and actually create our asset. So let's let's double check. Actually, yeah. Let, let's before we run the service, let's uh, let's create our database. Um, so in order to create our database, um, we need to run this uh, this migrate command. And uh, in order to do that, we need to make sure that we have a place for the data to go. Uh, so we're going to create a data directory outside of our application. And there's going to be a SQLite file that is stored in that directory. And Polaris also comes out of the box supporting uh, Postgres. Um, and if you want to use MySQL or some other engine, you're free to do so as long as you configure your database uh, appropriately in the settings file. Uh, and you install the appropriate connector. Uh, Django comes out of the box with um, PsychoPG, uh, which is a connector for Postgres. Uh, but if you want to use MySQL or something, install your connector and then configure your database and it should be fine. Um, Okay, so now that we're about to configure our database, uh, we're going to do something a little different. Instead of having this config in database, we're gonna use Django Environ's uh, DB function, which is something that I like to do um, because it, it simplifies, uh, it just simplifies the configuration. So instead of uh, having that dictionary, we're gonna have a Django.environ.m.db, or no, it's gonna be m.db. And then within, actually, so uh, I'm gonna uh, look at a project that I ran through uh, prior to building this because I've done this before and, and making sure I'm, I'm doing it right. So let me look at the code here and just make sure I'm doing this correctly. Um, let's just copy that. So we're gonna uh, configure our database to use uh, an environment variable to find the DB. And if that doesn't exist, then we're gonna have an SQLite file that we use. So as you can see, we're using the environments uh, database, and we're going to look for the database URL in the environment. If it isn't there, the default URL that we're going to use is an SQLite path, uh, looking for uh, data slash db.sqlite3 within our project root directory. Um, now that we have our database configured, let's try to create our database with uh, Python app slash manage.py migrate. Boom. Uh, our database is created and all the migrations have been executed. So our database is in the appropriate state. That is awesome. Um, so again, Polaris is a application, right? It's not just an SDK or a framework. It comes fully implemented with endpoints, database models, um, you know, static assets. It's a full-fledged app. The difference is that it also provides a framework or an API interface for you to customize uh, its behavior. Um, so it holds um, two, two different tables, two database tables, asset and transaction. 
uh, and we're going to create our asset right now. This is the asset that we're going to anchor on our server. So we're going to go into the Python console, uh, load the model for the asset object, and create an asset in our database. So we're in Python from Django. From Polaris, we're going to import our model. And in our model, we're going to create an asset object with the code SRT, because that's the code for the asset that we're anchoring. And the issuer uh, is going to be the, uh, the address of the issuing account. Uh, and so when you're setting up your anchor, this is going to be different for you, right? You're going to be anchoring a different asset with a different code, and you're going to need to actually issue an asset. Um, and we have materials documentation uh, that documents how to uh, issue assets. Uh, but for now, we're just going to use the SRT uh, asset here. So here is the public key for the issuer. Uh, and I'm actually, that's all I'm going to do for now. I'm, like, I'm going to also uh, enable SEP24. Uh, this asset object also needs the distribution seed. Uh, so there's two accounts for every asset. There's an issuing account and there's a distribution account. The distribution account is the one that's actually going to be receiving and sending payments. Uh, and so we're going to need to control this uh, account from Polaris. So we need the secret key for that account. And I'm not going to show you right now uh, in this screen, uh, but I'm going to add it to this asset um, in another screen that you guys can't see. Um, so yeah, uh, just give me, give me three seconds to, to add that. Um, okay. Uh, and, and this distribution seed, by the way, is going to be stored in our database. And this is obviously something that you'd want to make sure is secure. Um, it's going to be encrypted in the database. So whenever uh, seeds are stored in the database, they're encrypted, but they're only, but in they're decrypted when they're brought into memory. Um, so I'm going to import or I'm going to add this, uh, this secret key for the distribution account of SRT. Um, and it's going to be, allow my Polaris to control the distribution account. Cool. OK, so I just added the distribution seed. Uh, and so now if you look at uh, the asset in the database, uh, just look at the distribution account. It generates the account from the seed that I entered. So that's available as well. Um, okay, now that we have uh, everything we need in that department, in the asset department, we're gonna test out our anchor. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so we've configured it. Uh, everything is, is config, uh, correctly configured. So let's actually run our service and see what we got here. Uh, so we're going to go to manage.py and run the server. Okay, cool. So we, as you can see, Django has a server running uh, at localhost.8000. Uh, and so if we go there, uh, you can see that we actually don't have anything on our route uh, and that's okay. Uh, but we do have endpoints for SEP24. Uh, we have the authentication server, which is SEP10, and we have the TOML file. Uh, so let's check out our TOML file. So this is a very empty TOML file. It has the uh, the standard uh, you know pages that you would expect from an anchor, uh, but it's lacking some. So Polaris implements the TOML uh, file, but it allows you to um, to customize and to uh, add things to it. So this is the first integration that we're going to implement we're going to tell Polaris that we have additional information to display in the tumble file. Um, so we're missing information about the currency. Is it anchored? Is it a crypto asset? Is it a fiat asset? What kind of asset is it? Um, what, who, who is the organization behind this server? Um, you know, what's their contact information? Uh, this kind of stuff is missing from the tumble. We're going to add it right now. Okay, so let's get out of our settings. We're finally done with the settings. We're done with the environment. The URLs are set up. Everything's good there. Um, Let's go to, actually, we're going to create a new file. So let's stop our server process for a second. We're going to create a new file called uh, app slash app slash integrations. 
And this file is going to contain all of our custom code. All the code that augments Polaris uh, is going to be in this uh, file. And I'm also going to create uh, an apps.py file. Now, apps.py is a special file that Django looks for in every application that's installed in the installed apps list. Uh, and in, in, uh, specifically, it looks for a app config object within apps.py. Uh, and it runs any code within the app config class uh, before starting the application. So this is a good place for us to register our integrations. It's only going to do it once, uh, and it's going to make sure that uh, Polaris has the custom code that we write. Um, so from Django dot apps import app config, my app config is going to uh, inherit from app config the name of our application. And this is a Django thing, by the way. If you look at the documentation, Django outlines what this is and, and, and uh, why you need to do it. Um, so we're just going to, again, our app is named app. Nothing, nothing complex about it. And then we're going to have a, uh, a ready function. And this ready function is going to be run every time we start our application. Uh, and it's just going to do any kind of setup necessary um, before running our service. Uh, and so what we're going to do is, is we're going to register our integrations here. So we're going to do from integrations import. Now we don't have anything to import right now, but we're going to import this Tomo function first. Uh, and then from Polaris integrations, we're going to import the register integrations function. Now it's actually not auto completing, which is kind of annoying. I'm going to see if I can configure uh, the virtual environment right now. Uh, so it knows what Django version we're using and actually auto corrects and, and adjusts. Uh, um, sorry, one second here. How are we doing on time? We're a little, we're a little pushed. So, okay, this might go over a little bit uh, for any of you who have just strictly an hour. Uh, I apologize, but we're going to be in and around an hour, hopefully. I don't need the, uh, the autocomplete st stuff, but it, it will help for sure. Okay, yeah, no interpreter. Let's use the local one in our environment, set it up. Okay, now we have Django uh, available in our IDE and it actually knows what we're using. Uh, so register integrations, we're going to uh, we're going to register our integration that we haven't even wrote yet. <laughs> um, and then why does it say that it doesn't have any of this? That's concerning. Um, I don't know what's going on with the, with the highlighting right now. I, I thought I just configured my, uh, my virtual environment correctly, but maybe I didn't. I'm not gonna spend too much more time on this. Yeah, actually, this is not right. Uh, this is our this is my system Python. Uh, let's get, add um, the environment that I have in my. There we go. Okay, now we're using the virtual environment. Let's give this a second to to adjust. There we go. Okay, yeah, but we don't have this Tomo file still. But we're going to register our integration. So Polaris provides this register integrations function, and you can look at the documentation on it here. Registering integration. This is where you add, this is where you add the custom code that you write to Polaris, so Polaris can use it. Um, and so, as you can see, this is the exact same code that we're writing right now. Uh, we're registering our integrations, and we are only, we're only going to register the ones that we have. So we're not going to register all the ones that are listed here. Um, but let's get to it. So, this is the code that's going to run, um, and it's only going to run as long as we have this um, default app config environment or variable here. So I'm going to go apps dot uh, or sorry, app dot apps dot my app config. That's going to tell Django where to look uh, for the the code that needs to run before the application starts. Um, okay, let's go to integrations. We're going to uh, just define this Tomo function. It's not going to have any arguments, and we are just simply going to. Uh, yeah, that's all we need actually. So let's well, let me show you what happens when when we just have this. So we've registered the function, but the function has no code. Uh, let's see what happens when we run the service. So 
So it broke. Uh, and right now, uh, Polaris is in uh, debug mode. So you're seeing this nice UI that shows you what's going on in the code. Uh, typically, it won't show you that. I'll just give an error page if you're in production. Um, but uh, what's going on here is that the integration that we provide, the TOML function, it's not providing what Polaris expects. And so you're going to want to look at uh, the TOML function that we need to integrate. So this is the step one integration that we're doing right now. We're uh, integrating our TOML function. Uh, and our TOML function needs to have a dictionary returned uh, containing any of the keys, the top level keys right here. Uh, so let's actually do that. Let's, uh, let's return a dictionary. Uh, and let's do the documentation session first. Now, uh, you can look at step one uh, to see what fields that you can list here. So within documentation, this is the organization documentation. This is the information I'm going to fill out right now. These are the uh, properties that you can add. Um, so let's add an org name, Stellar Development Foundation. Uh, let's add a, um, we don't have a logo. Let's add a URL. We have a logo, but I'm not going to get it right now. Um, that's our home domain. And that's all I'm going to provide for the organization, but you get the point. Uh, you can add any of these other uh, keys as well. Let's, uh, let's add some uh, point of contact information. So Polaris doesn't know uh, who's actually building this and who's responsible for it. Um, so that's why we have this TOML file in this, uh, what are they called? Uh, point of contact or principles list. So it's a list, right? So we're gonna have a, a multitude of these. We only have one though. Um, and that person's name is Jake Urban. Um, and that's all I'm going to provide. Uh, I'm not going to provide my email or key base or anything like that. But again, you get the idea. This is all information that's going to be injected into our uh, our tumble file. Um, let's re let's add some currency documentation. And again, this is a currencies list. Um, so let's add a currency. We're obviously anchoring SRT. Actually, let's just do, let's get the asset. And we only have one asset in our database. So we're just going to get the first one. And then let's use the code of that asset and the asset uh, issuer. Okay, um, and then we're also gonna add the status. So this again is a test token, right? It's not actually real money. Uh, so this is a test token. Uh, SRT is the dominated using two decimal places. Um, and we are gonna give it a name description. Uh, let's see where we're at now. So as you can see, our, our code is refreshing every time we, or our, our service is refreshing every time we uh, change our code. And now we have some more information on our TOML file. So congratulations, we've done our first integration with Polaris. Um, as you can see, it has a principles section now. Um, it has the name that of the principal for this service. It has all the information on the currency section that we entered and it has uh, some documentation about the organization who uh, man maintains this service. Um, cool. So that is, so this pattern of writing code, registering that code with Polaris, and then having Polaris use that code, that that's the pattern of Polaris. Um, it has a lot of stuff that it can do on its own, but when it needs extra information that it can't automate, it requests it from you via integration functions. Um, okay. So we are doing decently on ter in terms of timing. Uh, we have a couple more integrations to implement. Uh, so 
Now that we have our Tomo, let's see how far we can get in the demo that I showed you earlier. So let's go to uh, this demo spot. Let's look at our demo site. Let's look at the config. Uh, we're not going to interface with our test anchor server on uh, solar.org anymore. We're going to actually uh, work with our local machine. Uh, we're going to use the same secret key uh, for deposit and withdraw of our SRT. Uh, and we're automatically going to walk through the process. I'm not going to you know, talk about exactly what's happening in the ZEP24 flow. Uh, so what happens here? OK, well, that's good. So we have, so let's take a step back for a second. I will actually go through a little bit what's going on here. Uh, our client, our wallet, uh, connected with our anchor. It uh, hit our Tomo file, because uh, it knows to expect a Tomo file at our home domain. Uh, it uh, determined that um, we have a transfer server. Uh, it got the information on our transfer server. So this is, uh, this is our info endpoint. And we actually haven't done any work here. Polaris does this completely on its own. Polaris responded uh, with the client, or responded from uh, responded to the client, uh, all the information about the asset. So as you can see, we're anchoring SRT for deposit. It's enabled. We have a minimum and maximum amount, as well as uh, a, fee, a fixed fee in percent. Um, this is going to be zero for the purpose of this demonstration, but you can change these. Um, and then uh, we actually went through authentication. So for step 10 authentication, you actually don't need to do anything either. Uh, Polaris implements this straight out of the box. Um, and it also imp implements the deposit endpoint. So once we got authenticated, uh, we made a request to make a deposit, or the wallet did. And, uh, and we responded, the anchor responded with a interactive URL. Uh, and the wallet opened up this interactive URL for me, the user, to fill out. And so that's what this is. This is a out of the box default, don't do anything Polaris view here of this interactive flow. Um, and so this is what the user would see. And I'm just going to say I'm depositing $100. There's no fee, right? So it's just $100 total. And when I deposit, eh, <laughs> okay, that's a Polaris thing. If you wait too long on the first screen, it can authenticate your session. Uh, so it says 403. Let's go through this whole thing again. Uh, so we have a fresh token and get through the flow. So 100. Oh, okay. So this is actually a key uh, piece of uh, development locally. So it's, it keeps on giving us 403, uh, and that's because uh, Polaris, by default, expects to uh, be working over HTTPS. And if you aren't on HTTPS, it doesn't allow you to go into the interactive flow. Uh, we can turn this off uh, by adding a environment variable called local mode. Um, OK, so now that we have this process and we're running in local mode, let's see what happens. Okay, um, let's try that one more time. Let's restart this service. Oh, actually, yeah, I think that's still, that makes sense. I, the code, uh, the service restarts when the code is adjusted, but not when the environment's adjusted. So let's, uh, let's do that now that we've added our local mode environment variable. Sure. Okay, so cool. It successfully, or it accepted our deposit request and it's now, uh, the anchor, the anchor we're building, is waiting for me, the user, to send the funds to the anchor. Now, on mainnet, when you're doing this for real, uh, you're going to want to uh, periodically ping your banking connection and see if I have sent the deposit um, that you have that I have initiated, right? Um, and so, uh, again, there's a process in the background. Uh, that periodically pulls all the pending transactions, all the transactions that we know, the anchor knows, uh, we can expect payments uh, into our bank account for. And once they're there, once we determine that uh, a user has made a deposit into our bank account off chain, we're gonna, then going to deposit uh, the same amount of funds on chain. Uh, and so that's how an anchor works with deposit. But as you can see, nothing's happening right now. We're just continually pulling the anchor and it's still in this pending uh, pending the user state. And that's because we aren't running a process uh, on our server that checks for pending deposits. So let's get out of this interactive flow here. We're not quite done yet. Um, okay, let's stop the server. So uh, this is a good point to talk about Polaris. So Polaris is a web server, right? It implements the API endpoints defined in step 24, but there's also a variety of um, 
of other tasks that Polaris needs to perform in order to function properly. Uh, one of those is, is checking up on pending deposits that we can expect from users, right? Um, and so in order to actually check up on this, Polaris comes default with a pull pending deposits uh, command line tool. So what you would do is you would have the server running and you would also have this pull pending deposits process running as well. And it's gonna loop. We could run this once and just check once for pending deposits or we could loop and, and run this. Oh, I misspelled it, it sounds like. Pull pending deposits. Okay, so complain to me though, because I haven't implemented the integration. It says, you know, you're not ready to run this command line tool because you haven't implemented pull pending deposits yet. And you're right. So let's go to integrations. So our first integration was just a function that we pass to, um, to Polaris, but this second uh, integration is actually a part of a bigger class. Um, so we're gonna implement uh, a Rails integration class. So Rails integration is a class, an integration class that we're gonna subclass um, and implement the, uh, the functions outlined in Rails integration. I misspelled that, Integr integrations. Okay, um, so we're gonna define this pull pending deposits function and it comes with a bunch of type hinting that I don't have import, in, imported currently. Okay, and we actually are just gonna return a list of all the pending deposits. So this is Polaris. So Polaris is gonna call this function periodically from the pull pending deposits process that we run. Uh, and, it's going, and it's going to expect that we connect to our bank, uh, look to see if there are any pending transactions that have actually been sent to us, and then return the ones, return the transaction objects that are passed, uh, return them back to Polaris so Polaris can actually submit them to the network, right? And so because we're not actually gonna receive any payments on testnet, we're actually going to just return every pending transaction and mark them essentially as ready. Uh, and so this tells Polaris to go ahead and move on and submit the transaction. So let's go ahead and uh, run this again. Let's run uh, our uh, server function. And now let's run our uh, Python app manage.py pull pending deposits process and loop it. So it's always running. Okay, it's still giving me problems because I actually haven't even registered this function, right? So now I have my Tomo, but I also have my uh, Rails integration class. So I want to register my Rails integration class with, uh, with the Rails uh, keyword of the register integrations function. Boom. So now my uh, pull putting deposits uh, code is registered with Polaris. And running the pull pending deposits function was successful, and I have my server running. So let's go through a, uh, a process again and see what happens. So this is the same as the last time. I'm going to just uh, say I'm going to deposit $100 and Polaris is just going to move on. It's going to assume that I sent it. So Stellar is actually executing the transaction now. Um, and it's actually on the Stellar network. It's giving me SRT in the, to in the wallet uh, that I used. Boom, there you go, complete. So if I were to look at the account that I'm using for this wallet right now, uh, I would see that I have at least 100 SRT in my account. Uh, the Polaris server using the uh, asset that I'm issuing uh, deposited funds into my seller account uh, after me entering information. Um, so there you go. That's the deposit endpoint. Uh, it's fully implemented, ready to go. It is 11 o'clock, uh, an hour on the dot, and you have uh, a deposit flow working. Now, uh, there are other integration functions that I need to implement for withdraw. Um, I think at this point, uh, I have to decide, do I want to, in terms of timing, do I want to go further down uh, and build, build out the deposit flow or do I want to build the withdraw flow uh, and just not go into detail in the deposit flow? Because there's a lot more you could do. I think I'm going to do the latter. So, um, so I'm not going to do this in the talk, but uh, there's tons of customization that you can do uh, using the integrations that uh, Polaris provides for the deposit flow. 
Uh, so again, you can customize the UI. You can make it a different color. You can change the forms presented. Um, and, and you can add forms. So right now in this demonstration, we're just asking for the amount. Uh, but we actually don't even collect anything about our users. Um, and again, this is custom to each anchor, right? So Polaris doesn't do this automatically. Uh, instead, it expects you as the developer to provide Django forms that's going to be presented to the user uh, and then that you can process. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to go through this. We just don't have the time. But this integration, uh, this, these section of integration functions are called form integrations. And they're actually available on the, uh, in the documentation if you go to step 24 integrations, SEP24 integrations. And this form integrations uh, section outlines what I'm not going to do in this talk today, which is uh, provide content for every transaction. So this is uh, providing forms uh, and UI customization uh, for every form that you need to collect on the user. So if you need name and email and photo ID and anything like that, you can uh, ask that from the user using Polaris, using these integration functions, as long as you register them. Um, but we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to prioritize having a um, having a uh, withdraw flow work. Uh, and to do that, we're going to run the entire service. So not just pull pending deposits. We're going to run every process that Polaris uh, requires. And to do that, we're going to use Docker, Docker Compose. Um, so I'm just going to copy and paste the Docker uh, Compose and Docker file uh, from this project that I've already written. Um, so copy Docker file, copy Docker compose, uh, and I'm going to go into the anchor that we're building right now. Uh, so we have these two files now. Uh, and if you look at them again, all the source code for this is going to be on my GitHub. Uh, but this is uh, essentially a config file that's going to run all the processes that you need to run in order to run a deposit and withdraw step 24 anchor. Um, so as you can see, uh, we run the server, the thing that actually runs the SEP24 protocol. We run the pull pending deposits, uh, or sorry, pull pending deposits uh, process that I showed earlier. There's also three others for withdraw. And I'm just going to speed through this because we're going to do some, uh, some questions afterwards, and I don't want to go too far over. Um, so uh, we're going to build, actually, no, before we build our, our application, we're going to implement our, um, our, uh, reg our integration functions for uh, withdraw. So uh, withdraw has some integration functions that it requires on top of what it, you know, what you have for deposit. Uh, specifically, it has this outgoing, uh, execute outgoing uh, integration function that you execute the transaction. This, this transaction or this function, uh, Polaris calls expecting you to actually make a payment. So this assumes you've received a withdraw uh, payment from the user on the seller network. And you're actually going to send the, the, the same amount of funds off chain to the user via your banking rails. So we're actually not going to do any banking rails in this, right? We're not connect, connecting to any bank. We're just going to mark the transaction uh, as uh, completed uh, and say that we did actually submit it to the bank, even though we didn't. Um, so this is just for demonstration purposes. Uh, on in, in when you're actually doing this and writing your integration functions, you will want to connect your bank just like in pull pending deposits. Um, completed. And we're also going to update the fee uh, for the transaction. So right before we execute, we're going to mark uh, or we're going to calculate the fee that we're going to take uh, from the transaction. So the user sent me $100. Uh, we don't have any fees in this demo, but uh, you can charge fees. And, uh, and But for now, I'm just going to say zero, right? So it, this function is going to be called every time we need to actually send a payment to a user. And then finally, actually, no, that's all, that's all we need for withdraw, I think. Uh, and we're going to make this, um, this multi-process application by building, uh, oh, man, I need to start my, uh, my Docker daemon uh, that's loading up. So Docker is getting started. OK, uh, it's five minutes over. Um, I'm going to try to build the rest of the service. Um, in the meantime, I'm open to questions. Uh, if we want to, uh, I will just probably be working through this and demonstrating the withdrawal flow as I answer questions. Um, so uh, to the host of this event, uh, if you would like to, uh, to give me some questions, go ahead. And I'll answer them as we're working on this.
Uh, okay, so the you know one question is why use Django? Um, that's a good question. Uh, Django has the tools necessary to, to to do what we're trying to do. So Flask doesn't have this reusable app structure, right? So Django is a project that can contain any number of apps that you can plug and play. Uh, Flask doesn't have this requirement, or Flask doesn't have this. Um, this functionality, right? You have a Flask application and what the code is in Flask uh, is what it is, right? You can't just add an app. Um, you can install a package and use that package, but you can't just plug and play an app. Um, so that ability to just plug and play Polaris that comes with database models and endpoints, that's unique to Django. And, uh, and so it, it just made sense for us to do it this way, as long as we were using the Python stack. So uh, we have our Docker uh, process up and we're building our, our, uh, our containers. So again, uh, this is, oh, what's the problem here? Service server failed to build, copy failed, requirements.txt. Oh yeah, we don't have a requirements file. Let's create one, pip freeze requirements.txt. And this is just putting all our dependencies in a uh, text file. Uh, so when we launch our Docker image, it can build them according to the file. Um, okay, so we're installing uh, our dependencies right now, uh, and this is probably just going to take a minute. Um, and uh, and once that completes, we are going to compile our static assets. I think is the next step. Let's look at this Docker file. Yeah, so we're going to install uh, system packages. Uh, we're going to make a working home directory. We're going to make a data directory for our database. We're going to copy our app code, uh, copy our environment and requirements files. We're going to install those requirements, and then we're going to compile our static assets. Then, once we've done all that, we're going to run the run server command uh, and actually run our application. Okay, so now if I run docker compose up, hopefully this works. Yay, okay, so now we have all these processes, pull dependent deposits, watch transactions, the actual set 24 server, um, and we all, we all have it running. Uh, so let's go ahead to our demo and look at what uh, the withdrawal flow looks like now. Uh, again, I'm going to deposit 100. There's no fee. And for a draw, uh, the wallet actually submits the transaction to Stellar, and the anchor is going to receive that. Um, the anchor is going to receive that uh, that payment. So I'm confirming that I want to send this payment to the anchor. The wallet is making a Stellar payment to that anchor right now. The, our anchor service that we built is going to pick up that payment via our watch transactions process. Um, and watch transactions is going to then mark it as ready for execution. Uh, the Polaris will then call our, um, our execute outgoing transaction function that we wrote, and it will mark the transaction as completed. And as you can see, uh, our transaction has completed. And so uh, we have effectively uh, withdrawn funds from our Stellar Anchor account or from our Stellar account. Uh, and we now presumably have them off chain in our bank account. Uh, and so obviously we're not collecting the bank details. So like typically an anchor would say, what's your bank account number? What's your bank routing number? We need to know so that we can actually send you this money. Uh, and so we're not collecting that. And again, uh, the documentation is there and Polaris provides that functionality, uh, but we're not gonna request that information right now in this demo. Um, okay. Cool, awesome. So we're 10 minutes over, not too bad. Um, but yeah, that's how you build an anchor using Polaris. Uh, there are a lot of other integrations. Polaris is pretty extensive uh, and it's in the beta phase or not beta phase, but it's in pre-1.0 -re pre release. So uh, there are still breaking changes that are being made occasionally, um, but uh, they're for uh, ultimately to become stable uh, and to make a 1.0 release that uh, will be coming soon. Um, Okay, cool. I think we're done in terms of demonstration. Uh, now I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, so that is a good question. So there was a question about Node.js and whether or not we're willing to make a version for Node.js. And uh, the, que the answer to that question is keep asking. Um, we've gotten a, a handful of requests for it. Um, but the reality is at the, at the moment, uh, it's going to be a lot of work for 
our team to maintain uh, two different versions of it. Uh, so it's not, it's not worth it for us yet. Um, but if there is significant demand, uh, then we might deem it worthwhile. So uh, make it known if you want to use Node, um, and we can, we can discuss that further uh, on GitHub or via Keybase or however you want to contact us. I'm trying to think if there's anything else um, that I should mention. Um, so this, we did step 24 in this case, um, right? This is Polaris implements step 24, but again, it also implements a lot of other steps. Um, one that we just added support for is step 31. Step 31 is a step or a standard that allows two anchors to facilitate international remittance payments. So the idea is that user A would send money to user B um, by giving money to their to one anchor, that anchor would send money to a different anchor, and then the receiving user would, or sorry, the receiving anchor is going to send that money that it received from the anchor from the sending anchor to the receiving user. So it's this little like anchor or sorry, user anchor anchor user flow. Uh, and the cool thing about this is that users don't even need to know uh, that they're using Stellar. It's just a payment from one bank account transaction to the next. Um, and so Polaris uh, provides the integrations necessary to support a SEP31 receiving anchor. So if somebody wants to send you payments uh, from across the world in a different currency, and you wanted to use those funds that sent to you to then pay uh, your own customers in their home currency, you can do that using Polaris' SEP31 integration. Okay, um, so I think that's it for questions. Um, thank you guys for tuning in uh, and hopefully you guys learned a lot about Polaris and how it works. Um, if you have any further questions, uh, I'm available on Keybase. That's where a lot of our uh, the SDF employees um, live in terms of chat. And uh, yeah, all right. Thank you for, for tuning in. Have a good day, guys. Bye.